I th Caleb is uh, away from us today, so I'm filling in. I haven't done announcements in a long time. There is an art to it. Uh, reminder that today is Communion Sunday, and we take that time to remember the Lord's death. Testing, testing. Okay, we're on. Okay. Being Communion Sunday, it's uh, we remember the Lord's death. Get it in front of the mouth. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> but uh, we also uh, receive a benevolent offering. Now, uh, you, you can give to the benevolent offering, which is kept for special needs that come to our attention. There was a special financial need that we were able to meet this last week. And, uh, but uh, you can give any time to that, just designate either writing on your check or get an envelope that's labeled benevolent offering. But uh, we kind of tend to en emphasize that on Communion Sunday. And the offering boxes are on the walls uh, in the back of the auditorium in the corner. Also, there's one in the foyer. Now, there's no youth group tonight. Uh, is it now? Is it tonight and next? Yeah, tonight and and next week. Uh, no, no youth group. Uh, Six o'clock tonight. We will be having a video from Dr. Robert Jeffress. What every Christian should know about future things. That's in the back chapel. Six o'clock. Now, Edie is going to be starting a new Bible study for the ladies by Lisa Turkhurst called Trustworthy, and. Uh, Monday at 5 p.m. is the time you can come to the back chapel. Ladies, take part in that. Or Tuesday morning at 1030. Now, there is a new men's Bible study at the Family Impact Wellness Center. The Five Marks of a Man. So it's going to start on Thursday evening the 7th and uh, also Saturday morning the, the 9th and uh, 630 in the uh, evening or 7.30 on Saturday in the morning. So that opportunity is there. Now we have a promotional video, I believe, for that. So go ahead, play that if you would, please. I think one of the things that we all realize is that men are confused in our society. We're confused about what it takes to be a man. We're confused about what a man should do. We have stereotypes that are just inaccurate. And there's other things that we think, well, every man does they actually shouldn't do. It's a huge difference between a boy and a man. You can be a 15-year-old man, and you can be a 45-year-old boy. My name is Brian Tome. I've written a book called The Five Marks of Man. I encourage you to take a look at it. I think it'd be helpful for you and any woman you know who knows you're going to read that book and be thankful you read it because I think it would be different on the other end. It's time, guys, for us to go from being a boy to being a man. And these are the five things that every single man has coursing through their veins, and those who don't are boys, and we need to get to a new place. Okay, so there's an opportunity, guys. Now, uh, last Sunday was a baby shower for the Steiner family, and uh, little Isaiah was there, and uh, the ladies had a good time, and uh, so we have a video of that event, so go ahead and play that.
Oh, guys, we miss out on a lot, don't we? Now, this is missions month. We take a whole month and think and pray and put our heads together about missions. Uh, say, what's, what's missions? Okay. I heard a good definition of missions is any ministry that does not directly benefit your ministry. Uh, it can be missions right around here, or it could be missions on the other side of the world. So we had a great opportunity in our adult Bible class to listen to George Weber and uh, as he shared how the Lord has worked in his life and used him and Shirley in his work and continues to do that. And we're, we're thankful for that time. He's going to challenge us in the word this morning. Uh, we are going to uh, each week take up a love offering to bless each missionary. There are envelopes in the back or you can just designate it on a check for the missionary love offering. So we will be taking that up. And once again, the offering boxes are on that back wall or out in the foyer. And so be sure and check your bulletin for the weekly activities. Let's do an activity right now. Stan, let's push it together. We're going to rise up, put our armor on today. Here we go. Oh, church, arise and put your armor on.
other in the Lord. I'm greeting. Okay. Good morning, church family. Am I am I good, Caleb? Thank you, sir. He carries the team up there. <laughs> Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Timothy. It'll be chapter 6, and we'll start in verse 11 and go right to 21. But you, Timothy, are a man of God, so run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life, along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. And I charge you before God, who gives life to all, and before Christ Jesus, who gave a good testimony before Pontius Pilate, that you obey this command without wavering. That no one can find fault with you from now until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. For at just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and only almighty God, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. He alone can never die, and he lives in light so brilliant that no human can approach him. No human eye has ever seen him, nor ever will. All oh, honor and power to him forever. Amen. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable, 
Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our own enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasures as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. Timothy, guard what God has entrusted to you. Avoid godless, foolish discussions with those who oppose you with their so-called knowledge. Some people have wandered from the faith by following such foolishness. May God's grace be with you all. Let's pray. God, our Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this Christian life that we're able to live, that we can be called your, your children, sons of God, join heirs with Christ. I thank you for the sacrifice you made to pay for our sins. I pray that we take our Christian life seriously. I pray that we guard against distractions and things that pull our focus away from you, uh, things that, that lobby for our time that aren't beneficial, that don't spur us toward a closer relationship with you. Help us to remember that you are life, you are the ultimate reality, you are purpose, and that's where true joy is found. Um, lead us to a deeper relationship with you and, and a, a renewed focus on our faith and our relationship with you. Bless this time that we have to listen from our speaker, and I thank you for our church family. We love you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Since it is Missions Month, what a glorious time that is, we're going to learn a new song called Here I Am, Send Me. So if you stand again with us.
It's my privilege today to introduce our guest speaker. We, meaning Edie and I, served with George and Shirley Weber in South Asia. And so uh, George will be sharing their work that they did there in South Asia. Theological education is our theme for this month of missions. And so we have a uh, experienced person who was out there on the front lines doing that work. George Weber, would you please come and minister to us this morning? Thank you. Thank you, Tom. It's good to be with you this morning. And I want to thank you for inviting us to be able to come and share with you not only about what it, what's happening in South Asia, but also what's happened in our life, and, and that I might challenge you in your life, what you might be doing for the Lord. We just sang that song, didn't we? I'm going to be 79 years old, and Shirley's a little bit older than I am. But I'm not going to tell you what her age is because that might get me in trouble when I get home. I don't know about that. But anyway, we can still be used of the Lord even in our later years. And for you young people that are sitting here, I hope you don't get bored this morning. But anyway, God can use you too. There's a real challenge out there in the world that we face today. In America, in South Asia, in Europe, all around the world, and it's a real challenge. I want to share with you from chapter 6, one of the verses that was read for us earlier, and that's in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20. This uh, verse of scripture really impacted me, especially in my ministry as I taught the pastoral epistles in South Asia, and as I worked with young men and women there, uh, it, just, it just opened my heart to what the Lord wanted us to do. And the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, he says, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. That phrase, guard the deposit. When we deposit our, our money in the bank, we want it guarded by that bank. We don't want the, 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 the bank to you know, fiddle around with it and, and take our money and, and put it someplace else. And if you've had anything valuable at home, you want to put it in a safe place where you hope it is guarded so that thieves don't come in and, and steal it. And the Apostle Paul was writing to Timothy and said that something has been deposited in your hands and I want you to guard it. I want you to take care of it, and I want you to preach it in truth. And that's the gospel. The gospel is a very valuable commodity in our hands. And the gospel is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and rose again to give us a new life, to give us eternal life, that we might spend all eternity with him to forgive us of our sins so that we might live a better life here. And that's what Paul is saying to the apostle, uh, to Timothy. He says, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Look at chapter 1 and verse 18. First of all, verse 11. First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11. And I'm just going to use the phrase out of this verse of Scripture. It says, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. 
Paul first said that he was entrusted with the gospel. And now he was challenging Timothy to do the same because in verse 18 it says, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage a good warfare. And so we see in these scriptures that Paul was writing to Timothy, he said, look, I've been entrusted with this. You've been entrusted with this. Now guard the gospel and preach the gospel. And that's a responsibility that was given to Shirley and me as we prepared to, to go to South Asia to preach the gospel. And then over in chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul says this to Timothy, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to reach others also. And you, so it's, you see, this whole thing is like passing the baton. Paul got the baton, the gospel. He passed it on to Timothy. And then he says to Timothy, Timothy, now it's your turn to pass it on. I received the gospel through a Sunday school teacher when I was 16 years of age. And God saved me. Never in my life did I ever dream that I would have a life that I've had now. I was shy, I was bashful, and then God saved me, and then he called me into the ministry. He called me into the ministry by an elder in the church. How many of you are elders in the church? If you see something in a young person, don't forget, I think God might want you to do that. Because that's what happened to me. And I never dreamed of it, and God called me into the ministry. But I never thought I'd be a missionary. I never thought I'd go overseas to tell people about the gospel. But God did that in my life. And then when I discovered that two men had died on the field in which we uh, worked these last few years, when I discovered two men died in a certain place, they gave their lives for Christ. God said, I want you in that place. That's where I want you to go, to take their place. And that's the way God led me. But interesting enough, I was a single fellow. And I was going to go by myself. And then I went to our orientation program with the Association of Baptists. And there were eight single girls there. Now, I, I don't know, man. Uh, eight single girls. But there was this one single girl that was really cute. And she could play the piano. And when she played the piano, it was like it soothed the, the wild tiger in my heart, you know, just uh, the way she played. And I thought, man, maybe she would work. But, you know, the thing about God, he's, he's interesting. This single girl that I later married, she, God had called her to the exact same spot. And out of those eight single girls, I got the best. And we got married, and then we went to South Asia. But God does that. This is the way he works. He's, he's fantastic the way he works. And to take us to this country in South Asia was a thrill for us because when, when we got there, of course, we had to learn the language. And if I was to speak in that language, you wouldn't understand anything. You thought I was charismatic and I was, you know, speaking in tongues, which I was speaking in tongues, but we had to learn that language so that we could communicate what's in this book in that language. And that was a thrill for us. When we turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and we read this passage of Scripture from verse 11 to 20, perhaps you've heard this Perhaps your pastor has used this text uh, several times, but there's some interesting things in here. It says in verse 11, flee these things, 
We are challenged on every side today by things that would pull us away from walking with the Lord. There are many challenges. And over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it, it talks about fleeing youthful lusts. How many of you young people have lusts? How many of you old men have lusts? Do you have them? Paul was writing to Timothy to flee those things, and we have to. We have to. And Paul says that here to Timothy, this young guy, and he says, pursue, go after. And so he says, go after the righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. He says, pursue those things. And then in verse 12, he says, fight the good fight of faith. And that's the challenge of preaching the gospel is to fight the fight of faith. But there's another thing that he talks about, and it's not using those kind of words, but if you look at the context of this passage of Scripture, in verse 13 he says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who is the testimony before Pontius Pilate make the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display in proper time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen and can see, to him be glory, to him be honor and eternal dominion. What he was saying here is finish. Finish. He says fight. Flee, flight, fight. And then finish. And that's the job we have before us is to finish the task until the Lord comes back. And so Paul gives this instruction to Timothy and then over in chapter, chapter 1 and verses 13 and 14, again, I have to go back and, and read these verses for you. He says here, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, per persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted act ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of the Lord overflowed me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul was empowered with the gospel, and so he wanted Timothy to have that same power. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, he says this to Timothy. Chapter 2, chapter 2 and verse 13, excuse me. He says this to, to Timothy. He says, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love of Jesus Christ. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And so Paul tells Timothy that he was entrusted with the gospel, and now he's saying you'll be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then over in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, he has these words. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so you just see this theme from Paul's heart to Timothy. Timothy was a pastor. Timothy was leading a congregation, but he wanted him to take that valuable gift that was entrusted to him and to pass it on. And for those that he entrusted it to, to be passed on to others. And that's the privilege that, that I had in South Asia when we were there. I had that wonderful privilege. And I, if you had been in our Sunday school hour, I was able to show slides of, of, of that work and how God worked and touching the lives of others. And I want to just share with you uh, some experiences that I had in, in South Asia with some young men. 
and just hear their story. The first one I call Timid Timothy. Timid Timothy. Now, you, we've been reading about Timothy and Paul here in this passage of Scripture, but Timothy, if you really look at his life, he was timid. But God took the hold of that man, and he used him. He was Paul's son in the faith. He traveled many places with Paul as he was chosen from Lystra when he was uh, saved there. He was sent by Paul to different places. And then he was even in jail with Paul. And this Timothy, timid Timothy, he comes to the church in Ephesus. And you think when you read this verse of Scripture, Timothy thought, well, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave. I'm going to give up here. Listen to what he says in chapter 1 and verse 3 to Timothy. He says this, As I urge you when I was going to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. And when you read what he says later on, Timothy sounds like he was having a hard time. And Paul says to him, stay. Stay in Ephesus. You know, sometimes when you face these challenges, you want to get up, get up and leave, you know. I'm getting out of here. And, and then where we were in, uh, in South Asia, we faced those challenges. But God gives you the strength to stay. And Timothy was in the midst of wolves. He was in the midst of leadership challenges. Read 1 Timothy and see all the challenges that he had. And Paul tells him to stay there and work it out. He even had challenges in taking care of the widows in the church there. I'm going to tell you about a fellow whose name is Ashatosh. Ashatosh. Tom, you remember Ashatosh. Here's a young man with a Roman Catholic background, and he was working in a, in a place where they put the oxygen in the tanks. And fortunately for him, when he moved to where we were working in, in, in the city, he got that job there. And right near it, there was a new church that was being started, that we had helped start. And he went to that church, he got saved. He got saved at that church. Later on, this fellow had to move because of financial needs. So he moved into this city near a place where they exported things all over the world. And hundreds and thousands of people moved into that area to get jobs. So he was there. And I heard that he was having a Bible study there with some of the, the people that were close to him. And so I went and visited him. And later I came back home and I thought, I bet if we talk to him, we can get a church started in that area. So I took another man with me and we investigated where Ashatosh lived and what he was doing. And I said to him, because he, he was ready to be trained. and. I said, let's do it. Let's see if we can get a church started here. So we did that. I went out there. We found a place where we could meet. It was just perfect for meeting. There was a place for, the, for Ashutos to live. There was a place where we could have our meeting. There was a place for a little library we could put in there. And so we did it. And Shirley and I moved to this area. And we were the only white people in that whole area amongst thousands of people. And we began our work there. It's amazing what God did in Ashutosh's life. He started to study in our Bible college. He got his education there. And eventually we had to move out of that area because we were too high profile. And it was too dangerous for us to be there. And so we left everything in Ashutosh's hands. 
Ashutosh continued that ministry even without our presence. And we started the LifeGate Baptist Church there. And even though we're not there today, that church is still going. It was interesting because why did we name it LifeGate? Well, in the area we lived in, there were factories all around, and there was a naval yard there, and everything had a name on it. This gate, that gate, this gate, that gate. I said, let's call ours LifeGate so that people can come to this church and find that Jesus Christ is what? The door, the gate to eternal life. And so we did that. That's how we started the church in that place. And so Ashatosh is still working there today. And the church is still going. And that's exciting to me. Because if you knew Ashatosh, he wasn't, he didn't seem like he was a very outgoing people, person. But he was. Because he went out and visited apartment after apartment and to see that church started, and he's leading that church today. So I call Ashatosh my timid Timothy, who God took and used in a very special way there. The next person I want to talk to you about is tough Titus. And if you turn over to the book of Titus and read the book of Titus, you find out about him. In verses 4 and 5, It says that Paul says to Titus, to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace in God the Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And so Paul sent Titus to Titus to uh, Crete, and if you read about Crete in the Bible, that was a tough place, a real tough place to work. He called Titus that he was his partner and fellow worker in the faith. He was with Paul in Galatia. He, he was in, sent by Paul to many different places, but he was left in Crete. And in Crete, there was trouble with the leadership, there was trouble with the lady, lady, and there was trouble with the Cretans. Let me see if I can remind you what it was like in, in Crete, because it, down in verse 12 it says, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. How'd you like to work in a place like that? That's not a very, what's a Fowlerville like? Is it kind of like that? Is that the kind of uh, environment you have here in this area? Well, that's where, that's where Titus went, and Paul tells him to, to stay there, and I want you to preach the gospel there. There's a guy who's now in heaven, that I had a chance to work with uh, in Sunday school class. Uh, so you got a chance to see his picture. But his name was Chopin. Chopin, if you'd have known Chopin, he was like a, a, a ball of fire. I mean, he was on fire. And uh, when we first moved to the city, I wanted to do church planning there. I wanted to see a church started and... and Somebody said, well, why don't you take Chopin? And I thought, oh, brother, you know, Chopin, you know, he's just, boom, and here I am, you know, I'm like this, you know, I'm kind of <laughs> the, 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 the timid side, but Chopin wasn't afraid of anybody. He was not afraid to preach the gospel. He would preach the gospel to the prime minister of the country in which we were in. But he came alongside me, and we worked together for about four years to see a church started. He became my disciple. He helped start a church there with me. He went from that church and started another church. And then eventually, he went back to his home area and got another church started. This is what he was like. He was a man of no fear. He 
he started a soccer teams that went all over the area in which he lived. And these soccer teams shared the gospel with the people that were there. He was on fire for the Lord, and I just thought of him as being tough. Tough. He wasn't well educated, but he was a man that wanted to serve God. And his work is still going today. And his son-in-law is running that work today, where he started. And it just was exciting. He trained others. Uh, if, you, if you were in Sunday school, you remember the picture of the three men standing there together? That, he said, that is my grandson <laughs> because of how we work together. And so that's a thrill. That's a thrill seeing that happen in the lives of men. Now, the third person I want to talk to you about today is a man named Tychicus. Tychicus. And you find his name throughout the New Testament. How many of you know who Tychicus is? <laughs> Nobody does. I didn't know until I started to study the pastoral epistles. Look at verse 12 of Titus chapter 3. And he says, when I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me in Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. If you read about Tychicus in the Bible, you'll find out something about him that is really, really neat. And maybe some of you are like this. I call him Tireless Tychicus. Tireless Tychicus. He was always serving the Lord, busy serving the Lord. He was called a beloved brother by Paul, a faithful servant, a faithful minister. And he was sent everywhere by, by Paul. He worked in Ephesus. He worked in Colossae. He worked in Crete. This guy was everywhere. He did everything. And he was really in need. His name, in the language that we spoke there, his name was Tuki. <laughs> Tuki. That's the way they translated his name, but tireless Tychicus. Another young man I had an opportunity to work with was like this. And he is serving the Lord today. His name is Alljoy. Alljoy. And Alljoy came when we were starting our first church as a, as a friend and as someone that might be involved in ministry. And Chopin brought him to me. He said, can, can he join us? And I said, sure. So we did that. He joined us. When another missionary came to our place, he asked me, he said, George, uh, is there anybody that can help me? And I said, sure, take all joy. Because all joy was beginning to develop in the things of the Lord, and he did. All joy helped this missionary start another church in the city in which we worked. And also, whenever I needed somebody to go someplace, like Tychicus, I could call on all joy. And he went to another place for me, investigated that, and we began another work in that place to start a church. And we started that, we got that going. He was just a, a, a fabulous young man. And uh, if you remember the picture, if you were in Sunday school with uh, me dressed with the, the skirt on, uh, that young man is now working, teaching in our Bible college. He's the pastor of a church. And he is the as chairman over our whole association of churches that are there. We have 18 churches in that place. And, you know, you look back in the lives of these uh, men that you had an opportunity to work with, um, it really thrills your heart because they were taught the word of God, not just by me. I mean, there were others that got involved in their lives. But all of these men were used of God are being used of God today. And when I think of Tim Timothy, and I think of tough Titus, and I think of tireless Tychicus, is that a pretty good way to say that? I'm, I'm, or, or, 
get the approval of your pastor here. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it causes me to remember the men that I had the opportunity to work with in, in, in the country in which we were. But there's some girls here, some young ladies, aren't there? Some older ladies. How about this? This is for you. How about faithful Phoebe? It's in the Bible. Faithful Phoebe. Read Romans chapter 16 and see about Phoebe. She was faithful. How about precise Priscilla? She was the helpmate of a uh, What's his name? I forgot it. Wasn't he? So, uh, you know, like Shirley. What? Aquila. Aquila. Oh, I can think it was Apollos. It just came. I'm old now, you know. I got to have trouble with that kind of stuff. Anyway, um, you know, how about Priscilla? She was right there, the right-hand man of, of uh, Aquila. And that's what a wife can do. You can work as a team. And that's what Shirley and I did and Tom and Edie did when they were in that country. How about praying Lydia's? Pretty praying Lydia. She was a woman of prayer. And the God used her to see a church started in Philippi, working in her life. And then there's Dorcas, the doer, right? <laughs> Think of Dorcas. How about you women in the church? How can God use you here in the church? And I know he probably is using many of you. But see how God takes the lives of different people? There's the Timothys, there's the Tituses, there's the... Uh, um, Tychicuses and these women. I, when, I, when I think of theological education and how God can use people to get his gospel out, his message out, I think of all those people that are mentioned in the Bible, but I think of all the men and women that are working right now in the country in which we had the privilege of working. And it, you look back and you say, wow, you spent all those years there? You, see all, you saw all this work? It's, it's, it's exciting. And so Paul, when he's uh, writing to Timothy, and this, this verse of Scripture, you know, I, I just keep it in mind for myself, even though uh, I'm supposed to be retired. He, he said to, to, to Timothy that he wanted him to guard the deposit. I think we need to do that today in the United States and all over the world. It's precious. It's valuable. It changes lives. It turns lives around. And if you don't know what that message is and you don't understand what that message is, you need to know that Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again to give us new life and to give us forgiveness of sin to spend all eternity with him. Isn't that message precious? Isn't that message valuable? Isn't it something that we need to guard? But not only guard it, but to share it. Because there's wealth in it. There's wealth of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that's the message that we took to the country that we worked in. And I just want to thank you for the opportunity to share this this morning. And thank you. Tom and Edie for the opportunity to be reunited with them today. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. And hopefully today, for the opportunity that you've given to us, look at your word, that we will look at ourselves, look at ourselves and look also, Lord, at, at your word to speak to our hearts so that we might be willing to be your servant to serve you with our lives. And so we want to commit that to you. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know you as their own personal Savior, help them to understand the gospel. Help them to turn to you and get that valuable uh, thing that is so precious to, to so many of us may become a part of their life. And Father, help us be willing to share the good news that is so valuable. We pray in Jesus' name.
Thank you, George, for just challenging us in this way. And that just leads right into our remembrance time where we come together to remember that Jesus Christ, our Savior, died on Calvary's cross. And the night before he went to the cross, he was with the disciples and said, do this in remembrance of me. So he took bread, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, this is my body which is given up for you. And so we have a opportunity here to quiet our hearts for a minute and remember that most solemn thing that the Lord Jesus died on Calvary's cross, that his body was given up for the sin punishment that you and I justly deserve. The Lord Jesus took that punishment. And again, he said, this is my body, which is given up for you. And so let's peel off the cellophane on the top of these cups. And then we can I'll say a short prayer, and then we can partake of this bread. Lord Jesus, you died on Calvary's cross. You said, I'll be giving up my body as you spoke to the disciples. And so we want to praise you and thank you for that good gift of your sacrifice on our behalf. In your name we pray. Take and eat. Then the Lord Jesus took the cup. He took the cup, and so we symbolize that today with grape juice, where we also would remember the blood of Christ. Because it says in the book of Leviticus, a book of the law, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So throughout the time of the Old Testament, before Jesus Christ came, animals perfect animals were brought for sacrifice to the temple so it had to be a perfect lamb that would be slaughtered for a sin offering and so we had the perfect lamb of god in the person of god in the flesh coming to this world and his blood being shed for us so it's with and again on the night that the lord jesus in the upper room said, take, drink, this is my blood given up for you. Let's pause for a moment, think on that, and then I'll pray. Lord Jesus, we are undeserving, but we are awed that you gave us this privilege and um, to where we can now remember that it was your blood shed for us. And we have the privilege then of having a relationship with you, having a right relationship with the one true God. We give you thanks. We pray to remember that sacrifice. Take and drink. After the disciples had ate and drank, they sang a hymn before they went out. So we're going to have the worship team come now, and we will sing our closing hymn. Would you stand with us and sing?
promise commitment sheet. This is something we, we do every year because we kind of have two parts to our missions program. Uh, one, we have a number of missionaries that we support financially through our general fund giving. So when you donate to the general fund of, of our church, uh, there are a number of missionaries. We're going to meet one. For some, we'll get to see him again. For other folks, this uh, may be a new thing to Meet Mark Sturkin, who is one of our supported missionaries, and he is un involved in theological education and meeting the needs of pastors and church leaders in Latin America and the Caribbean. And uh, he is supported through our general fund. But we also have another fund to support homegrown missionaries. And uh, we just had the Hartman family uh, leave for a time. They'll, they'll be back for a little bit before they go back to the field in Brazil, but uh, Anna grew up right here. And uh, so we, we have several homegrown missionaries, and they are uh, supported by our Faith Promise program. So uh, basically what, what I w would like you to do is just take a magnet. You have magnets on your fridge, right? So uh, all normal people do. Uh, <laughs> Magnetize it to the fridge and then just ask the Lord if he would have you take part if, if you're not already in the Faith Promise program. Uh, there, and there are, you, you could give just a one-time gift for the year or if you want to put in weekly or if you get paid twice a month, you want to put in twice a month, uh, that's, that's there also. But just, just ask the Lord, what, Lord, what do you want me to do in, in regard to the Faith Promise program? So. That's another thing we're considering during this month of missions. And uh, I was encouraged today. Uh, here is a, a, a couple that just served the Lord, and they're getting into their mature years. They're not getting old. They're, just, they're, they're mature. And they're still serving the Lord. And it ain't always easy, but they're still at it. And now... If you've been in church for years, and if it's a missions-minded church, you've been exposed to probably a lot of missionaries, and there's just no way you're going to keep track of all of them and so on. But maybe the Lord just might lay George and Shirley on your heart for you to just pray for them. You could ask to get their uh, prayer letter or uh, however they, they communicate. But uh, I have a, a couple special missionaries that... Uh, one is involved in uh, theological education in East Asia and met them years ago. And they're not a little bit, little bit younger than me and Karen, but uh, they've been at it some years and they're still at it, serving the Lord, training pastors and, and church leaders. So I get their email newsletter and when I get it, then I just bow my head and pray for Tim and Charlene. But anyway. Maybe the Lord will lay it on your heart to pray for George and Shirley. But speaking of prayer, let's pray. <laughs> thank you, Father. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you that you cared enough to send your son, Jesus, to save us, to pay the price of all our sins that we could be freely received in him. Oh, Lord, thank you for the awesome opportunity and responsibility to share the good news 
with people around us and through missionaries, through people around the world. Help us to honor you as you enable us. May Jesus receive the glory. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. We love you. You are dismissed. Mm -hmm.